Thank you, choir, for that reminder <clears throat> that God is the Lord of everything. We've been, I've been trying to share a little bit about that in some way, and specifically being the Lord of everything in our finances as well, in our giving. And I'm going to conclude this morning with this uh, message series uh, regarding uh, our my title theme of Dare to Believe. That was the backdrop of what I was sharing, that we were daring to believe that God would provide. That uh, The example I was using from Scripture of Paul talking to the Macedonian church, uh, that they were indeed daring to believe that God would provide. And if we believe that, if what the choir just sang is true, that God is the Lord of everything, then He's the Lord of all that we have then everything that we have actually comes from Him first. And it's His anyway. And it's right and suitable that we give back to Him. And so we've been talking about that with regard to how we give uh, financially as a church and how we see it happening here in Second Corinthians as Paul is writing this letter. And as I said, I want to kind of com- conclude how that uh, this all comes together and what Paul was saying And again, just remind us that what we're actually saying is that we're believing that God will provide for us. That's what you say. When you give back to God, you are believing that God will provide for you and for your family. When these Macedonian Christians who didn't really have much of anything gave to this effort that Paul was talking about in in sending uh, uh, some money towards the Jerusalem church and helping the impoverished there, They believed that though they didn't have much, God was going to provide for them. And so this morning we'll kind of conclude that and see what that looks like uh, with regard regard to God's blessing in our giving. Now I had shared with you uh, the last two weeks that there are some results to uh, what we give and how we give. And um, it's a, a principle that has been... Uh, talked about, and unfortunately a principle that gets, I think, uh, misconstrued and, and twisted, and, and unfortunately it, give, it gives the church a bad name sometimes. Uh, but there is something that is happening in our giving, and you'll hear this this morning when I read the scripture about you reap what you sow. Now, I'm sure you've heard that before. I'm sure you, you've heard that saying, you reap what you sow, in a lot of different ways not just necessarily financially, which is what Paul's talking about here, but you would say that when you're kids, and if you have kids, your mom or dad might say, well, you're just reaping what you sowed, you, you were sowing in your life. So if you were this way as a little kid, and now grandma and grandpa get to say, well, now you're just reaping what you were sowing when you were a kid, because it's seems like it comes back. Lots of different religions have this. They call it karma. Uh, Hinduism calls it karma, that uh, if you're good, then when you're reincarnated, you'll come back as something even better. If you're bad or if you're sick or if you have some kind of disease or some kind of uh, physical deformity, they believe that you did something bad in your previous life and you are reincarnated to this is why you have, you can't see or you have leprosy or whatever. They say that you, whatever you did in your previous life has now, you are, you're reaping what you were sowing in that previous life. So there, there's lots of people, lots of religions that use this same principle because there's some reality to the fact that how you are is what you're going to get. If you're a miserable person all the time, maybe you've worked with one of them, I have, it's really hard to be around them. And, and unfortunately what happens is it affects everybody, and soon everybody starts being miserable, and then they're miserable back to them. And it's like, this is what you are like, and this is what you kind of get back. It's this, this whole idea, this whole principle of reaping what you sow. And now Paul is going to use that same principle uh, with regard to finances, because there is some reality to that. There is some truth to reaping what you sow. Uh, I don't think and I don't believe in reincarnation or anything like that, but there is some truth to how you are to someone else is oftentimes how people are to you. 
And so in a lot of ways, you're reaping what you're sowing out there in, in the world. And Paul's going to talk about that in terms of giving and generosity. So this whole letter that he wrote is really climaxing at this point. He's really, he says a lot in 2 Corinthians, but the point he's really trying to get across is what he had started when he first planted the church. And so this section that we are reading from chapter 8 through chapter 9, we talked about the other week the need for generosity and giving. We said that that's important. Paul was saying that in, in to the church at Corinth that it's important for you to be generous. It's important to be generous people and as believers, as Christians. And then Paul uh, was going to be talking about the results of that giving. And last week, uh, he was talking about how you do it. H- how do we be generous in giving? And I gave you some practical ways in which we as a church can be generous in our giving. And now Paul's going to end this little portion in, in this letter, talking about this specifically with the results of the generosity in giving. There are results. Something happens in our generosity. God does something. God uses this in some way, and there are results to it. And I think this is where we get into trouble with uh, some people twisting all this. But just to remind us where we were and where we're going to, Paul is in Macedonia. He is up here. He is writing to people down here. That is what we're reading. It is a letter from Paul being in Macedonia, writing it to Corinth. And he's talking about the promise that they had made. When Paul planted this church through his missionary uh, journey, through his planting churches, he was also talking about helping to support the need in Jerusalem. If there were impoverished Christians there, and he was talking about how do we support these people? You can help. You can be a part of this by giving to this need. And Paul was planning on going back to Jerusalem and taking this gift from all these other churches, these Gentile churches, back to these Jews in Jerusalem and saying, here's what God has done for you. And so Corinth, when he had planted that church, said, yeah, we want to be a part of that. We want to give. We want to help. And Paul was thrilled about that. And so when he's traveling, doing his missionary stuff, he's telling all these other churches what Corinth had promised to do. These Christians down in this area had promised to do something amazing. And this area, Corinth, was a wealthy area. It's uh, very uh, probable that many of the Christians in Corinth could have gave a lot. They were, uh, it was a wealthy port city. And so Paul is going around telling all these other churches this, and they're getting excited, and they want to give. And then he hears back from Titus that uh, things aren't going the way that you had hoped. And so Paul sends this, 2 Corinthians is a letter that Paul's writing. He's going to send it with Titus and two other guys, and they're going to go down there, and they're going to try and help Corinth, the Christians there, fulfill the promise they had made. So Paul talks about the need for that generosity, how they can do it, and now Paul's going to end this with the results of that. He's going to talk to them about the results of this generosity, and he uses this principle that I just shared with you about that you've heard in many occasions, the reaping what you sow. Uh, You've probably said that to your kids when they're being naughty and you wanted them to be good. And uh, the reaping of what they're sowing is, I don't know if people still spank kids anymore, but that's what I got. You're going to reap what you sow. You're so being bad, you're going to get a whack. So Paul's saying you're going to reap what you sow with regard to giving. He told them why they should be generous. He told them how they should be generous, and now he's going to tell them what happens when you are generous. And he says this in verse 6 of chapter 9. Remember this. So after all he's just said about this gift, about giving, he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. 
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you in their hearts, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So Paul is ending here with, here's how it looks. Here's what happens when you decide to sow generously. And he talks about this service that you're doing. He's talking about giving. He's talking about helping these Christians in need in Jerusalem. And already there was tension we read about in Acts between whether these Gentile Christians were actually Christians at all or whether you had to do some of the Jewish stuff to be a Christian. And so now Paul is collecting all this money from these Gentiles and giving it back to the Jerusalem church. And he'll be able to share and be able to see, look what God's doing. These people that don't even know you and these people that you had even said, are they really Christians because they don't follow the laws of Moses and do these certain things, they're giving back to you. And Paul's saying because of that, God is going to be praised. And so he begins or he's ending this portion with the sowing and reaping principle. And Jesus had said this same kind of thing in Luke. The measure you use will be measured to you. Jesus was talking specifically about loving our enemies and judging others, how we judge others. Jesus says, the measure by which you judge other people, you'll be judged by. This sowing and reaping principle again there, Jesus is talking about it. The measure you use will be measured to you. Your generosity will reflect on you. Paul is saying you are, you are going to reap what you sow. And he uses something very familiar to them, uh, probably familiar to most of us, but certainly in a very agrarian culture, everybody was sowing some kind of seed. Everybody planted something because you were dependent mostly upon yourself for food in a lot of ways. And so Paul uses the sowing of the seed. If you sow sparingly, guess what? If you don't put a whole lot of seed out, you're not going to get a whole lot when you harvest. If you do put a lot out, if you sow generously, then the idea would be, all things being equal, you will reap generously. So the question Paul's asking us basically is, which is better? If you're a farmer, which is better to do? Sow a little bit of seed and get a little bit of harvest, or sow a lot of seed and get a lot of harvest? The answer seems obvious, doesn't it? Right? I didn't ask it because I didn't want anybody to get that answer wrong. It's obvious. If you want a lot, then you've got to sow a lot. Just throw that seed out there. If you do, you're going to harvest a lot. You will reap what is sown. He's using this imagery. Everybody gets that there because everybody in Paul's culture has sown seeds. They have planted gardens. They have planted crops, and they know and they get, if I do a lot, I'll get a lot. And Paul is using that same idea with giving. The same principle is at work here. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. And he's telling the church in Corinth, which do you think is better to do? To give reluctantly or unwillingly and just give a little bit or give a lot? And then he says, to, and doing it cheerfully. So he, he talked about that before. God, and I said this before, and I uh, believe this is true, God is not really interested in the amount that you give. God would, and, and, and Paul was not really interested in whether or not Corinth was going to give a ton of money. 
he was interested in what he says here. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. He didn't put a number to it. He said, give 10%, give 20%. Give. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give and not do it reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a, cheer, a cheerful giver. That's what Paul was interested in. That's what God cares about. This sowing generously comes from that. If you sow generously, I believe you are probably a, cheer, a cheerful giver. If you sow sparingly, oftentimes it's given reluctantly, or you felt obligated or compelled to give. Paul's saying that's not how it should look. But God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful giving is reflective of God's own character, reflective of how God gives. This is why God loves a person who gives cheerfully. That's what the language there that Paul is saying. God has this special kind of love for that person because that person is simply reflecting the type of love, the type of giving that God does. God lavishes His goodness on us. The Bible says that all over the place. God is abounding. He is abundant in loving kindness and grace and mercy, and He gives it to you freely. It is not coerced. He is not compelled to do it. He is not obligated to do it. Jesus was not obligated to come as a, as a little baby, helpless baby, and put on human flesh and suffer the way that He did. God is generous in His gifts, whether it is gifts of grace that you and I receive, the gift of salvation that we get because of nothing we've done, but because of Him. But He is also generous in how He gives to His people who are like Him in that they give cheerfully. Paul was driving that point home to this church in Corinth because he was more worried about their attitude and their motive about giving than the amount. But he knows that a cheerful giver gives generously because they are reflecting how their Creator gives. This is how God gives. God does not sow sparingly. He sows generously in everything. And Paul's saying, that also applies to sowing and supporting His people on this earth when you give. So God is the emphasis in this section. When we are called to sow generously, when we are called to give, when we are called to give beyond our ability, is what Paul says, that the church in Macedonia gave, and they gave beyond their ability. When we give sacrificially, what we are saying and what we realize is what Paul's emphasis is in verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly. The emphasis is on God, not us and our ability to give, but God's ability to give. And he says it in verse 11, you will be enriched in every way, or in verse 10, now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for, the, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. The emphasis is on God. God is able. He will supply. It is not dependent upon me. My reaping generously is not because I make a ton of money or because I have a lot of wealth. My reaping generously is because I know God who has everything and supplies everything will also supply me. So that passage in Philippians, and God will supply all my needs according to His riches and glory. Paul's talking about this specifically. He believes the, the Philippian church, the church in Philippi that Paul had planted um, in this same area. Oh, I don't have my map up here. In that same area that I had my map on, Paul was in prison. He was, you know, destitute. He wasn't making anything. The only church that was responding to Paul's need was the church in Philippi. And they were sending people to Paul and saying, here, take this. Our church collected it, and we're giving it to you. 
And Paul says, and God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Paul was putting the emphasis on God's provision to that church in Philippi. Though Paul was thankful to them, he knew that it was God taking care of, it, taking care of him. The emphasis on our giving is on God. It's not because we've earned something. It's not because uh, we deserve something. It's because God is generous in His giving, and therefore we ought to be generous in ours. That's why we're daring to believe that God will provide. When we as a church, and it's the end of November, that means December is going to be coming up, that means we'll have January, and many of us are going to be meeting about a budget, and we're going to talk to you about a budget, and we're going to say, here's what we want to do, here's what we want to give, here's the, our plans for the future in 2018, this is what we want to do, we're talking about, and I shared before, we're talking about doing some renovating in our fellowship hall, there's things that we want to see happen, we want to talk about a, another mission trip in the summer, we want to do a mission trip, these are all wonderful things. What we as a leadership team and what I've shared with them and why I'm preaching what I'm preaching now have to say is, do we dare to believe that as we seek to sow generously, whether it's giving to others that are in need, whether it's going out and serving God in local outreach or doing missions, whether it's taking care of this facility for ministry, are we daring to believe that God will provide for us? If we, I believe in what Paul's teaching, if we sow generously, we will reap generously. Because what we are saying is, God, you are the one who supplies it. You are the one who has the power to do it. And we are trusting that you can and that you will. That is what Paul is telling this church in Corinth. You can trust that God can and He will. There is something that God sees that is special about that generous person because it is reflective of who He is. God loves to see cheerful givers. That's what Paul's saying to this church in Corinth as he writes to them. He talks about the difference. He quoted uh, Old Testament there, Psalm 112. And that whole psalm is about the person who fears the Lord. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he kind of is contrasting this person who fears the Lord with this person who doesn't fear the Lord. And he's using the reaping and sowing principle. The one who fears the Lord is going to reap this in his life or her life, and the one who doesn't is going to reap this. And then he says there at the end of that psalm, and this is why Paul's quoting it, they freely scattered their gifts to the poor. He's talking about that person that fears the Lord. This is what they do. And because they have done that, because they have given generously, the righteousness endures forever. There is something that is happening that is beyond our ability that God does when we give generously. There are benefits to giving back to God. God blesses when we give back to Him. Way, way, way back when God says to Abraham, I am going to bless you, and because I'm going to bless you, you are going to bless the world around you. As God blesses Abraham, God blesses the world. As God blesses the church, God is blessing the world. There is, there is blessing in our giving back to God. And the reality is, God doesn't need tons of wealth to do it. The fact that none of us are excessively wealthy, remember I told you this giving pledge that Warren Buffett and Bill Gates were doing? And Bill Gates' net worth is $77.2 billion. I mean, it would take us forever just to write all those zeros. And that's his net worth. One guy is worth $77.2 billion. All of us in this church aren't worth that much. But God doesn't need that. If God says that your faith, if it is as small as a mustard seed, Jesus says your faith is this tiny little mustard seed, and faith as small as that 
can move an entire mountain, Jesus says, then the smallest of gifts can do amazing things when God sees the heart behind it. So there's someone that was here in church and was listening to all this and is by no means a wealthy person. We've helped them in the past, and they said, I want to give this gift back to the church. And it, it wasn't much. It was, it was $5. That's all it was. And I said, thank you. This is exactly what God is doing in people's hearts. Do you know what God can do with $5 given that way? He can do way more with that than, he, than somebody giving us a million dollars just because they have it. And you think that's crazy. It is, because God works that way. If the smallest little of faith can move a mountain, then $5 can do amazing things. Because God blesses generosity. There are benefits to giving. God's spiritual and material enrichment of the giver. That is what Paul is saying here. That is the trouble we get into. That is just the principle that's there. And I know people twist it. Unfortunately, the truth, as Churchill, Winston Churchill said, the truth is often guarded by a bodyguard of lies. People use this principle that Paul's talking about here to say, you sow this seed and you will get rich. I, I know you've heard it before. I know it's out there on TV. That's what people say. The reality is there's, there's truth to that, that God enriches spiritually and materially the person who gives. The thing that Paul, I think, points out here is to enable further generous giving. That's the point. It's not to enrich yourselves. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Paul is saying God does this. God blesses the giver spiritually and materially in order for that giver to give back generously. It is not to enrich ourselves. There was a, a story I read about a person who did this. They decided to give half of what they earned back to God in various ways, 50%. And they tried to, to stick, this, stick with this. And so they had some things that they said, we don't need these anymore. They sold them so they could give them away. Six years they were doing this kind of thing, and they almost had nothing left in terms of being able to do the 50%. It wasn't that they were impoverishing themselves, but they were struggling to be able to give back 50%. And after six years, some things started happening in their life, and God started blessing them in different ways, and now they were able to do abundantly more than they did before. There's no time frame on this that Paul gives. There's no amount on this that Paul gives. He's just telling you, if you sow generously, the result of that sowing, God says, is I will enrich that person spiritually and materially so that they can keep blessing other people. I believe that God does that. I believe that God will bless when we are blessing others. That's a result of our giving. Another result is meeting the needs of others. I mean, when Corinth is going to give this gift, they are going to meet other people's needs. When we give back to God, God enables us to meet the needs of other people. Your giving back is meeting the needs of, of my, me and my family. The way that we operate in the EC denomination is our pastors are paid by our churches. Your giving enables me to meet my needs and my family's needs. That enables me to do things that you wouldn't do or maybe you're not called to do or you're not gifted to do, but allows me to do all those things. When we do this giving, we're able to meet needs. When someone says, I've got no money to pay for oil, we as a church can say, we want to help you. And you've done that by giving. I, I can't count the number of times that now I've given to people. 
because they were in need. God blesses us so that we can bless others around us. And because of that, we are able to give praise and to give thanks to God. And, and Paul says that that is a benefit. God is the one who is getting the praise for this. When I'm sitting around my table and giving thanks to God, that's why I'm giving thanks to God. The reality is I am solely dependent on other people to meet my needs. And I'm giving thanks to God that He is the one meeting the needs of me and my family. This church is solely dependent on other people giving. And now we can praise God for God meeting the needs of Grace Church, whether that's doing local outreach ministry or whether that's paying the electric bill to Schuylkillhaven Borough. We can give praise to God for the fact that we can meet our needs because other people choose to give. These people in Jerusalem were going to be able to praise God because He was meeting their needs because other people chose to give. And maybe that doesn't seem like a huge thing, that generosity aspect, but when you're the recipient of that, it's a big deal in your life. People have come to Jesus because somebody met their need, simply because someone was willing to reach out and say, I want to give this to you. They have turned their lives around and come to Christ. This is why when there's any natural disaster, we've got people on the scene meeting others' needs, whether it's giving physical things or giving financially, because we believe that that does something in the person's heart. And that will cause them to turn back to God and say, thank you. I didn't do anything to deserve this, but somebody is on my doorstep with a pack of water after that flood or that hurricane. And they're here simply because God has blessed them, and so they're called to bless the world around them. God's generosity is experienced through His Son, which is why Paul ends this this way. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. The reason you and I give is because we are thankful for God for what He has done. Our love for God should cause us to give. That's why I believe Paul ends this the way that he does. If you've forgotten everything else I've said, remember this. God has lavished His goodness on you, His generosity on you by sending His Son. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do for it. God just gives it to you because God is generous like that. And because He is like that, He has called His people to be like that. And when we are like that, Paul says, you will reap bountifully. You will reap abundantly so that you can bless others. So as I close this morning, as I end this, I hope that you've learned something from what we've shared this morning and from the past two weeks. One of the things is, Sharing and giving is not a one-time thing. It is a lifestyle. Sharing and giving and being generous is a way of life. And so God has called us to that, each of us, to dare to believe that He will provide for us. And we'll be picking up on that theme more as we enter the new year. But as we've gone through this, hopefully you've appreciated it. Hopefully I have not offended you. Uh, by sharing what I've been sharing. I know giving isn't always the most wonderful thing to talk about, but I hope you've been challenged as well. I know I have, and Jess and I have talked about that and how we are called to give, and I hope that you've been challenged as well, and I hope that we can see that God doesn't need a particular amount from any of us. God is looking for our attitude and our motive behind it, and I believe that if we are willing to sow generously, we will reap generously so that we can bless the world around us in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word to the church in Corinth um, that as Paul was writing this letter to them and challenging them, we're able today, this morning, in the 21st century Christians to see that we are too called
to give and to give generously. Lord, I'm thankful that you supply for your people that all the gifts that we receive, everything that we have is from you. And because we are blessed by you, we are called to bless the world around us. Lord, I pray that you would help us as people, as Grace Church, to sow generously, that we might also reap generously. And Lord, as a result of that, we might be able to see your work in this church, in people's lives, and in this community, and around the world, really, as we support missionaries who go. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us as we have gone through this time of thanksgiving and enter into a season of Advent. And as we enter that season, it's another time in which we are blessed because you sent forth your Son. And Christmas seems to bring out generosity in people, Lord, and I pray that that would continue in our lives, in our church, that this generosity would be a direct result of our love for you. Our, our cheerfulness and giving back to you and seeing what you will accomplish with these gifts that are yours to begin with. Lord, thank you for those who give and give generously here at Grace Church and those who continue to support this ministry, Lord. It's because of people here. It's because of this church family that we can do what we do. And I give you thanks for them, and I give you thanks to you, Lord, for providing our needs. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.